I appreciate a praying church. Jesus reminded his disciples that his house, his house would be called a house of prayer. I think it honors the Lord when we take time together as a church family to bring up those things that have great kingdom importance. So thank you, worship team, for leading us in that time. I want to remind you, we have uh, these little journals. They're super fancy. Uh, we encourage you to grab one. They're not really super fancy, but they do work. Uh, they're up here at our table, and uh, they are free for anyone who wants to use those. And uh, this is a great tool uh, to take notes or to begin to write down those things that uh, you believe that the Lord is speaking to you. And I, I hope you have those moments as we've been taking this uh, journey through studying the bigger, broader context and picture uh, of God's word. Um, I'm hoping you're beginning to understand even better where we've come from, where we are today, where we're going, where we fit in to God's divine agenda. Uh, so we've just kind of gone through this little moment of prayer, and I, I have some things. You know, you can pray in the dark with your eyes closed, and you can talk to the Lord with your eyes open with the lights on. So before we get into uh, tonight's message, which is uh, going to be in Genesis chapter 22, I want to start to prime the pump just a little bit in your mind. And this might be something that you would write down uh, on a note card in your Bible, uh, in a little packet like this. But here's what I want you to start to think about. It, let these questions begin to mull around in your mind and invite the Holy Spirit to help you think through this, okay? So the first question would be this. What do you hold very dear in this life? I want you to think of one, two, or three things that start to rise up to the top when you begin to think of what is it that I have in this life that I just hold so dear to me. It means so much to me. I I'm talking about the, the, the level of things where if you were to lose this, it might break you. Uh, if this were to be taken from you, it would, it would just wreck your world if you thought this was in danger, you would do anything to protect it. Uh, so real, uh, th these are things that you would hold very deeply in your heart. What is very dear to you in this life? Get a very clear picture of that in your mind. We need to get there before we begin this journey tonight. The second question I want to ask is as you're following the Lord, what are you finding difficult to obey right now? There's lots of things that God directs us to do. Some things are easy. Some things are very difficult. Is there anything in your life right now that God is leading you, directing you, prompting you to do that you are finding very difficult to obey that, to follow through with that. What is something difficult for you to obey right now? And the final thing I want you to think about is has God ever given you a promise? Or are you believing God for something right now in faith? Has God ever given you a promise that you're holding on to? What do you hold dear in this life? What are you finding difficult to obey right now? And has God ever given you a promise or are you believing the Lord for something right now in faith? You may or may not have answers to all of that, but that's 
we're going to address some of those things tonight, and, and I'm hoping that as we dive into the Word of God, that God may wrestle in some of those areas and speak to you very clearly in some of those very important areas. Uh, so I want you to open up your Bibles, Genesis uh, 22, 21, we're going to be in, in that particular area. We're talking about Abraham and his son Isaac. So just in a light review, I want to uh, remind you, for those of you who have been taking this journey with us, I've been challenging you to memorize 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. This is the foundation for a biblical worldview. For any serious Christ follower, this forms the foundation that you stand on. Uh, and and uh, here the Apostle Paul instructs Timothy that all Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable uh, for teaching, reproof, correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may become mature, fully equipped for every good work. It is essential as we become serious about following after God that we believe Him at His Word, that God is our source of truth. We've discussed that there are many competing worldviews in our culture, but for someone who is grounded in the kingdom of God and following his king and following her king, we must be a people who are under the authority of the scriptures. And, and here we believe and teach that the scripture has absolute authority over any believer's life and that all that God says is true. And this is our guide. Uh, this gives us solid footing as we follow the Lord uh, during the days of our lives here on the earth. So we've, we've covered some common ground here that is in the very beginning of the Bible. Uh, we've talked about Genesis 1 and 2 and talked through creation. God created all things through the power of his spoken word. Uh, we've talked about the fall in Genesis chapter 3 where Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit uh, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in doing so, they uh, defied the word of God. They disobeyed him. They uh, betrayed their trust in him. They believed a lie about him. And they were separated from God's presence. And the result was the death of their soul. The curse overcame the earth and humanity. And there was a great separation between mankind and God. And then we've watched through the chapters as they've unfolded the many different ways that man has tried to fix this problem. Adam and Eve uh, had a, an honorable mention attempt as they just tried to cover their shame on the outside with some fig leaves. That didn't work. God came and saw right through that. So just we've learned that trying to clean ourselves up on the outside will not fix the problem that we have on the inside with God. That doesn't work. In Genesis chapter 4, we watched the, the model of Cain and Abel. God laid out a specific way that mankind was to approach him. It was through blood sacrifice, all pointing back to the promise of Genesis 3.15 that God would send a deliverer to redeem mankind back to himself. Cain tried to approach God another way. But this didn't work, and Cain was rejected, and he never repented, and all his offspring went another direction. To this day, you will find the Cain mindset. You can approach God any way that you want. You can believe anything that you want to believe, but the truth is that God has made a way to approach him, and he will only accept the way that he has made. So we see that approaching God in our own way doesn't work. Well, then we watched an even bigger problem unfold in Genesis chapter 6. And God looked down at mankind and he said, everything they do is, and everything they think is evil continually. They're no longer even trying to seek God. They've gone their own way. And that, was the, that resulted in God's judgment over mankind, the flood. And that could have ended mankind but God was determined to work out his purposes and he, re he, he preserved Noah and his family. 
Noah was the last man on earth who was still righteous before God. In other words, Noah was still believing the promise given back in Genesis 3.15. Noah uh, was still approaching God the way that God had prescribed. So we have the flood, and then Noah's family, after the flood, repopulates the earth, and generations pass. And then we get to a place that is even worse than the days of Noah. We get to the, the days of Babel. And here, not only is mankind no longer trying to, uh, it, they're not even trying to approach God, but now they're trying to make a name for themselves. They're not even seeking God. They're going to set up their own system. They were building this, this great man-made tower. Archaeologists would call this a ziggurat. Uh, this was a tower where they would, they would try to meet the God that they were worshiping in the air. They had totally abandoned the God of their fathers, the God of Adam and Eve, and they had embraced their own God and their own way of, of, of worship and, and, and it, it had totally rejected God. So at that point, God rejects mankind. He divorces them. He walks away. He disinherits them and he confuses the language. Uh, he stops them from doing what they're trying to do and spreads them all over the face of the earth and walks away. So now God has no people on the face of the earth. He has disinherited them. And that brings us to Genesis chapter 12, where God does not give up on humankind, but he picks one man, Abraham, right out of the heart of Babel, Mesopotamia, the, the land of Ur. And God says, I'm going to pick one man, and I'm going to make a covenant with this one man if he will just believe me and take me at my word, and I will make of him a great nation, and I will bless him richly to the point that as he becomes a great nation and he inherits the land that, that I have promised to him, that he will ultimately not only receive my blessing for himself, but through him and through his, uh, his seed, all the world will be blessed. You see, it was through Abraham that God was going to bring the deliverer promised back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. So that's where we're at. And Abraham is very excited about this wonderful promise that God has given to him. And, and, and as, we, uh, as we review that promise, it begins with God is going to make this uh, multitudes come out of his lineage. But we have a problem. In fact, we have many problems. We have oppositions coming to the promise that God has given Abraham. So I, I want you to think of your own promise, because we gave a little bit of thought of that at, at the beginning. Has God ever promised you something? Some of you are still waiting for the fulfillment of that promise. God promised Abraham something, and we would think, well, I guess that would just happen. But it, it turns out that it's not actually easy to lay a hold of God's blessing every time. You see, Abraham has issues. Number one, there's, we run into these um, obstacles to the blessing. For one, the land that was promised to Abraham was filled with Canaanites. And you could ask Joshua and his 12 spies if that was much of a problem or not. These were formidable people, excessively evil, terrifying, giants, warlike, nobody would want to go up against the people that inhabited the land that God was promising to Abraham. Well, that's a problem. There were obstacles in the way of Abraham experiencing the fulfillment of God's promise and blessing. Here was another obstacle. Sarah was barren. Sarah was not able to have children. Now, that would be a problem if Sarah and Abraham were in their prime. But Sarah and Abraham were not in their prime. God gave this promise to Abraham and Sarah after the age that was humanly possible to have children. So now we have yet another obstacle. Not only is Sarah barren, but even if she was not barren, she's not going to have children. Now she's past the time of, 
uh, past that age that she's able to bear children. So there's all these obstacles. Here's a bizarre one. It's been 25 years since Abraham gave, uh, received the promise from the Lord and still no children. You would think with that promise in their old age that God would need to get that program running pretty quickly. 25 years and there's no great nation, there's no land, there's not even a single child yet. We have problems. So in that time period, Abraham and Sarah fell into bad thinking, which a lot of us uh, have fallen into ourselves. They tried to help the Lord with an impossible scenario. How many of you think that the Lord needs your help with the impossible scenarios you're facing? See, this is always a bad idea. When, when we think that, you know what, I think God is faltering you know, maybe he tried, he, he, he gave it a whirl, and it just didn't work, but maybe if I came in with the assist, he'd have what he needed to fulfill this promise so that I could have the blessing. Uh, as silly as that sounds, a lot of us have taken that path before. Well, Abraham and Sarah are no different. So in this 25-year stint of no children from Sarah, they come up with the bright idea why doesn't Abraham use Sarah's female servant and he, she's of childbearing age, we could have children there and then God's promise would be fulfilled. Well, that seemed to make sense to Abraham and Sarah. I don't think that impressed God very much. So poor Hagar ends up bearing a child to Abraham and that child's name is Ishmael, and that, that will become a very important fact. It's important you know that uh, as the biblical story and narrative unfolds. That's going to create a lot of problems uh, between the promised child, Isaac, that would come from Sarah, and this, the nations that would come from Hagar, from Ishmael. In fact, we still see that playing out today. Through Isaac, we have the Jews, uh, and through Ishmael, we have the Arabs. And the two do not get along to this day. Disobedience and our lack of faith always has consequences. Many of them long term. And not only to ourselves. They can hang on for generations. So there's been a lot of problems with Abraham trying to receive the blessing that God promised to him. So if we could at least say this, we can learn from Ishmael, that fiasco with Hagar, that we should never try to bring about the blessings that we want from the Lord in a worldly manner. We should never go around God's way of doing things to attain God's blessings. We try this a lot. Don't do it. Do not do it. So let's, let's think about this. As you're thinking about the promises that God has given to you, as you're thinking about the frustration that often comes when we try to attain the promises and the blessing that God has given to us, we must not become discouraged by opposition. In fact, I hope that you learn tonight that's often part of the journey. There's much to learn through the obstacles and the, obs uh, and the, uh, the opposition that we encounter in seeking after God's blessing. But all that brings us to Genesis chapter 21 when God does deliver on his promise. Let me just read to you the first couple of paragraphs in Genesis 21. The Lord kept his word and did for Sarah exactly what he promised. She became pregnant and she gave birth to a son for Abraham in his old age. This happened at just the time God said it would. And Abraham named their son Isaac. Eight days after Isaac was born, Abraham circumcised him as God had commanded. Remember, circumcision is the sign of of the Abrahamic covenant. It's very important. Verse 5, Abraham was 100 years old 
when Isaac was born. Sarah declared in verse 6, who by the way is 90 at this time, God has brought me laughter. Someone just laughed, you're right on cue. All who hear about this will laugh with me. Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse a baby, yet I have given Abraham a son in his old age? By the way, does anybody know what Isaac means? Laughter. He laughs is how you would translate that name. And this is not laughing at, this is laughing with. Sarah is so filled with joy. Ninety years old, her dream of having a child for her husband and playing a part in this very important promise is realized. What a beautiful fulfillment of the promise. God always fulfills his promises. God, I believe in this journey, wanted Abraham to understand a couple of very important concepts. Number one, nothing is impossible with God. As you begin to look at the obstacles that you are facing, as you are trying to follow out the call that God has given you, maybe the promise that he has revealed to you, things that God wants you to see in your lifetime, understand and believe with all of your heart that nothing is impossible for the God that we serve and who speaks to us. And secondly, God keeps his promises. If God has given you a promise, whether it's something right from his word that is special to you or whether he's revealed something directly to your heart, God keeps his promises. And he will bring about his purposes both in the big picture and in your life when it comes to his word. So that brings us to Genesis chapter 22. Abraham has been given the most meaningful promise and he, God has been faithful. Now, if we had asked Abraham this question that we opened up with, is there something in your life that you hold and cherish so dear, so close to your heart? If, if we asked Abraham that question, I have no doubt in my mind what his answer would be. Isaac is the answer to that question for Abraham. He and his wife held on to that promise for 25 years. They failed trying to achieve the promise in their own power. They were overwhelmed with the obstacles and the impossibilities. They wondered how this would come to be, yet they trusted God, and he delivered and gave them Isaac. Such a special young man in Abraham's life. So let's look at this story. This is a fun story, church. You're going to enjoy this tonight. So, so Abraham has this special boy now in his life. In chapter 22, let's watch what God does with this. It says, sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. In your Bible, I want you to circle that word, tested. God tested Abraham's faith. Now, for those of you who have been given a promise, for those of you who are believing the Lord for something very important, I want you to hear those words tonight. Your faith will be tested. God tests the faith of his people. Now, you might write in the margin or write on a note in your notes the reference James chapter 1, verse 13, which makes a distinction. God tests he never tempts. Our enemy, our adversary, tempts, but our God will test. Well, what is the difference, you might ask? Well, a temptation, the, the goal is to see the failure of your faith. But a test, the goal is to see the fruition of your faith. One who is testing your faith knows that you can succeed and will strengthen your faith through the test. One who tempts your faith believes that they can discourage you and cause you to stumble and give up on that faith, walk away from that faith, and that is the goal of the temptation. God will never do that to you. 
but he will test you. He will allow great difficulty to come against you. He will allow you to experience discouragement, suffering, pain, all kinds of setbacks. Absolutely. But he's doing it that your faith may be strengthened and that you may learn something about his heart in the process. So that's where we're starting. God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, making sure we got the right son because he does have another son out there, but we're the legitimate son that he has with Sarah, his son of promise, the one he loves more than anything else, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I will show you. That is a bizarre command for Abraham to receive from the Lord. I cannot imagine what went through Abraham's mind when God tested his faith in this way. A burnt offering. For those of you who don't know what a burnt offering is, it is the only form of offering that by the time you are finished with it, there is not a scintilla of it left. It is all burnt there is only a small pile of ashes by the time you're done with the burnt offering. You don't save any portion for the Lord. Nothing gets saved in any form. A burnt offering is done in your place because of your sin, and you are cleansed temporarily. In fact, if you read Leviticus chapter 1, there is a very great detail given Leviticus 1.3 says, If the animal you present as a burnt offering is from the herd, it must be a male with no defects. It says in verse 4, Lay your hand on the animal's head, and the Lord will accept its death in your place to purify you, making you right with him. It says that a burnt offering is a special gift, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. So not only is it completely burned, but it's considered a special gift that was ple a pleasing smell to the Lord, and it was indicating a total surrender to God. God asks Abraham to do this with his son. If Abraham goes through with this, there will be nothing left of his son. So let's see how Abraham responds in verse 3. The next morning, Abraham got up early. Let me pause. There's no alarm clocks in Abraham's time. So without an alarm clock, there are typically two reasons that I get up early. Number one, I'm really excited. I think we can eliminate that one. The second one is I hardly slept all night long. There's something heavy on my mind, and I get so sick and tired of trying to sleep that I end up just getting out of bed probably a safe place to land with Abraham. He gets up early. It says that he saddled his donkey and took two of his servants. He had many, by the way. He was a very wealthy man, along with his son Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering, set out for the place God had, called, God had told him about. Now, Abraham had lots of servants, he typically would not chop his own wood. But for those of you in this room who have chopped wood before, it's a great place to think and work out frustration. It's a wonderful time of processing life, chopping wood. Abraham chopped his own wood this morning. He needed to swing something. He needed to process some things in his mind. I want to point a couple things out because obedience and surrender are going to be major themes in this story. And it says that Abraham, on this really difficult request, not a request, it's a command from the Lord, he got up early the next day and he began to get to it. 
I don't know, I think it would have been at least within reason to say, Lord, I'm going to take three weeks and pray over this one. You're asking a lot of me. But I think it's notable for us to see that delayed obedience is disobedience with the Lord. We need to do it in his timing. And Abraham did. And he, he did this immediately. Not only is delayed uh, obedience disobedience, but I would also say that partial obedience, for some of us who try to skirt around it that way, is complete disobedience. Partial disobedience is complete disobedience. Partial obedience is complete disobedience. Abraham is guilty of neither. Verse 4, on the third day of the journey, this is a long journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. You know, I can only imagine three days of walking with Isaac, Watching Isaac run around, run up the path in front of you, talking with Isaac, thinking about the promises that are wrapped up in Isaac, looking at Isaac with tears in your eyes, thinking how much that promise means to you, and trying to process what God is asking you to do. Three days of that. You know, for any of you who have ever owned a dog, I grew up on a farm, beef farm. And we always had dogs, and, uh, you know, sometimes a dog kind of comes to the end of its life, and on a farm there's a very humane and quick and cheap way to deal with that situation. But for some of you, you've owned those dogs. I remember a dog that I had with me in Virginia, and I brought it up here to Pennsylvania with me. Uh, just this cute little lovable, snuggly little dog that had... Uh, my whole family just loved that dog. I loved that dog, and its time was coming. Any of you ever been there? And I knew what needed to be done. But I can tell you, even as a farm boy, I just for the life of me couldn't go do what I knew was going to be the cheapest, totally humane way to deal with that situation. I, I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. So I had to take it to the vet so that the vet could do it for me because I wasn't strong enough to do it. Well, for me, that trip was only 15 minutes. I swear that was the longest 15-minute drive I think I have ever taken. And guys, that's a dog. Abraham is walking his son to put him down. I, I really can't imagine the heaviness on Abraham's heart on this journey. This was not an easy test. I mean, God, God was putting all this on Abraham himself. This wasn't just some hard time that Abraham had encountered. It wasn't because of the, uh, you know, the curse around us, how bad things happen. It wasn't because of somebody else's sin. It was just God saying, I'm going to test your faith. This was not easy. But here Abraham is. And, you know, as, as we start to, to look at this story, it's, let's look, let's just continue to follow here in verse 5. He says, Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little further. It's time for just some father-son time now. We're getting close. We will worship there, and, and then we will come right back. You know, I think if I could fill in the blank there that comes right after my words, I would put Abraham hoped. I hope we come right back. I'm believing we're going to come back together, not just me. Abraham's faith was really being tested here. Verse 6, so Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders while he himself carried the fire and the knife. So I want you to understand that Isaac has the wood for the sacrifice on his back as he's going up the mountain to become the sacrifice himself. As the two of them walked on together, verse 7, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. We have the fire. He's doing the mental checklist here. And we have the wood. Where is the sheep for the burnt offering? Can you imagine? 
Abraham being asked that of his son. Oh, my goodness. That had to be one of the heaviest moments of the entire trip. Strong Abraham says in that moment, God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son. And then they both walked on together. I want to make note of this. Abraham is not exactly sure what's going to happen here. God did not say anything about the details about how this turned out. What Abraham knows is God promised that through this son, I will see nations, a multitude of people come. I don't know what this is going to play out like. I am scared right now. I'm nervous. I don't like this position, but I must be obedient because I trust God. He trusts God without all the answers. You know, I, I would pause here to say I think some of you are in this position tonight maybe as you think about that promise that God has given you and the obstacles that are in the way the unlikeliness as the years have gone on that that promise may come to fruition and you're starting to wonder I would encourage you to follow Abraham's lead here and trust him without having all the answers God is calling you to trust him and remember that he is the God of the impossible now, we are given this glimpse in the New Testament that Abraham did have an idea. He had determined in his own heart, this is what I think is going to happen. I'll, I'll read to you from Hebrews eleven seventeen. You can write that in the margin of your Bible. I'm just going to quickly reference it. Hebrews eleven seventeen. It was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned, so this is what he thought, that if Isaac died, God was going to bring him back to life again. So in this moment, Abraham is thinking, there is a very real possibility I'm going to have to kill my son. But if I do, the only way that my offspring and lineage will continue through him is that if God brings him back to life. Does that make this moment any easier for Abraham? I cannot imagine. I'm, I'm th this one's a tough one. So let's, let's continue the story in verse 9. When they arrived at the place where God had told them to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Now, the scripture doesn't mention what the conversation going on between son and dad was. Maybe mercifully so. But I want you to notice that Isaac is a very much now a part of this faith journey. Whatever was said... It does not say that Abraham overpowered his son and secured him to the altar. Isaac got up there, he did what his father commanded, and he was bound to the altar. And once he's tied, he's no longer a willing or unwilling participant. He's just there, and this is in his dad's hands. That's a lot of faith. Verse 10, Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. That is a loaded statement, and I, I want you to understand. I believe that this statement is talking about not when Abraham picked up the knife off the ground and walked up to his son. I think it's talking about the moment when Abraham was already at the side of his son, and he picked up the knife to kill his son. And God waited until that little switch in the brain fired that was going to drop the fist into his son. He waited in Abraham in that moment where Abraham was committed and going through with it. He didn't just let him tie Isaac to the altar. He, he went to where the knife actually began to start the plunge. And in the moment that Abraham was past the point of any more thinking, he was committed to it at that moment in verse 11, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. 
Don't lay a hand on the boy. Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. Then Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in a thicket. So we'll continue the story there, but I, I, I just I want you to see something here. First of all, I'll bet you that Abraham threw that knife to the ground so fast and had his boy off of that altar so quickly. He had passed the test. And now, in verse 13, as Abraham looks up, there is a ram caught by its horns in a thicket. A substitute for Isaac's death has been provided. This is a really important part of the story. God had to provide that substitute. Every one of us in the room who has children understands that Abraham would have gladly been the substitute. He would have happily given Isaac the knife and said, Isaac, you've got to tie me on this altar and I'm going to ask you to do some hard things, but I'm going to do this in your place. Abraham would have done that in a second, but Abraham did not have a substitute that was acceptable to the Lord. Only the Lord could provide the substitute, which is why when the Lord does provide the substitute, Abraham responds in this way. He says he took that ram, sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son, Abraham named the place Yahweh Yaira, or Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. To this day, people still use that name as a proverb, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. On Mount Moriah it will be provided. What will be provided? A substitute will be provided that only God can provide. Let me tie something in that's very interesting here in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4. Hebrews 10, 4 says, For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to, be take, to take away sins. That is why when Christ came into the world, he said to God, You did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer. You were not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. Then I said, look, I have come to your will. I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written about me in the scriptures. It says in verse 10, for God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. You know what I find fascinating about the death of Jesus on Golgotha. It is on the exact same mountain range. And many scholars believe that Golgotha is the exact point of Mount Moriah where Isaac was offered as a sacrifice. And just as Isaac walked up that hill with the wood on his back to become the sacrifice that God had called Abraham to give, so Jesus went up that same hill with the wood on his back to become the sacrifice, our substitute that only God could provide. You see, not just anyone could die on a cross and become the Lamb of God that would take away the sins of the world, as John the Baptist stated. That sacrifice could only be given by God himself, and it was. So when Abraham named that mountain Jehovah Jireh on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided he was talking about the substitute and that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ on the mountain of the Lord God provided a substitute for us because the blood of bulls and lambs and goats could not hold back the wrath of God forever and it could not atone us from our sins. It could not wash us clean and make us right with God. God had to provide that substitute, and he certainly did through Jesus Christ. Now, as we reflect on 
this story, you know, I think there's a couple important lessons and then I'm going to close. Number one, goodness, why? Why did God test Abraham like this? I think it's important for us to understand that God will take those things that we hold so very close, so very dear, and he will make sure that we do not love him because of the gifts that he has given to us. There are going to be times where God tests us in the area of those things that we hold so very dear. Be ready to follow through with those tests. You know, I think also it's important for us to, re to realize that God will call us to difficult journeys. And it may not even be because you've done anything wrong. It may be that God wants to reveal something about himself specifically to you that you can only see through the valley. Abraham would have never known Jehovah Jireh had it not been for this journey. And I'm sure when this was over, Abraham said, I never want to take that journey again. But I'm so glad I went on that journey with the Lord because I met Jehovah Jireh. God will take you on difficult journeys, journeys that you do not want to go on. And rather than asking, what did I do, Lord, to deserve this? We need to ask the question, what, Lord, are you trying to reveal to me about yourself? If you get stuck on the first question, you may find yourself repeating the hard journey because God has determined that he wants to share special moments and reveal special things about his heart with you. So always in the hard journey, be asking the Lord, what is it, God, that you are trying to reveal to me? I want to see it and see it clearly. Be willing to take, with a good attitude, those hard journeys. God wants you to trust him in these matters. The question comes because we quote Luke 9, 23 here a lot. Jesus' call to follow him as a disciple. If anyone wants to be my disciple, he must give up his own way or deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. He must be willing to give up everything in this life. So the question often comes up, does that mean that we all have to give up everything in this life? It means in your heart before the Lord you have to. And then it is up to the Lord what he will do with that. Now we just watched what the Lord did with Isaac. But it's very interesting. God didn't require Isaac from Abraham, but he did require that Abraham lay that down and show that he loved the Lord even more than Isaac. But there are times when God will require from us those things that we hold dear. You know, back in Genesis 17, Abraham had a son, and he loved this son, and his name was Ishmael. And Abraham had so much dreams and so much love for this young man. Abraham didn't hate Ishmael. He loved Ishmael. And it says in Genesis 17, 18, when he was understanding that God was looking at what he did through Ishmael and God had said, no, your lineage will not come through a servant. He had already told him that in Genesis chapter 15. He said, I am not going to honor my promise through Ishmael. And Abraham understood the implications of that and he said in verse 18, oh, may Ishmael live under your special blessing. Abraham had this breaking heart. Oh, oh God, that you would just reconsider, that you would just allow this to take place. When Abraham tried in his own power to receive the blessing of God, and, and God said no, there was this breaking, and, and, and God was saying, no, you have to surrender that. We're not going that direction. I have another thing that I'm going to bring my promise through. Now, it would have been easier for Abraham if God had said, you know what, Abraham, I love you, and I, in this instant, I'm going to make a concession. And, and my promise is going to come through Ishmael. Even though that wasn't my original plan, uh, we're going to work through Ishmael. That would have been so much easier on Abraham. 
But God looked at Abraham and said, no, you need to let go of Ishmael. He is not your son of promise. Sometimes we do have to lay down those things that God calls us to surrender. Sometimes God doesn't allow us to take the easier journey. You know, I I think of those in this room who have gone through a very difficult journey over this last year. You know, Evie, Rich, wouldn't it have been nice to just go up with your loved ones together? I mean, wouldn't that have been so much easier? Wouldn't that have been nice? But sometimes God calls us to these hard journeys because he's not done working the blessing yet out in our lives. He's not finished with our story. Even though there is an easier path from our perspective, God is not done working out his purposes in our lives. And sometimes those journeys are very, very difficult. But we have to believe him and trust him and trust his heart. You know, God surrendered his son for us, John 3, 16, as our substitute for God so loved his one and only, just like Abraham, his one legitimate son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. Jesus died as our substitute in our place. So I just want to finish with this thought tonight, going back to some of those questions that we opened up with. Is God calling you to obey something that is difficult for you? I want you to know that you can trust him. Has God promised you something and you haven't seen it come to fruition yet? I want you to remember the journey may face many obstacles, but the blessing will come. You must trust the God of the impossible. Trust his heart. He is laid down his most precious thing that he might gain us. Don't be shocked from time to time if he will ask you to lay down yours to show your love for him. You can always trust his heart in these journeys.